name, uh, everybody here knows me, but my name is Mireya Maki, and I'm the interim director for Kickstart Venture Services, which is set up to support the startups from, from UNC that have some sort of relationship to the research at, at UNC Intellectual Property. And today we are organizing our first uh, webinar series here, and we're here again to provide you know, some additional support for, for startups and really also help to introduce you to some fantastic players in, in our ecosystem as well, so that you get to know them and the services they provide. And uh, just in general, to really understand what the, the latest funding opportunities are for startups, particularly in, in these times, you know, with COVID related you know, challenges that we're all facing today. So we have a fantastic panel for you today. Uh, we're going to have our first speaker it is, is Michael Carnes. You know, so he works at the North Carolina Small Business and Technology Development Center, you know, which is a great, again, resource for you to be introduced as, as well uh, here at, uh, you know, at UNC and North Carolina in general. They provide a lot of counseling, education, and resources to, to small and medium-sized businesses. You know. So uh, besides, you know, the presentation he's going to give and the panel at the end is great just to know overall the type of, of support they provide as well. Yeah. And uh, uh, particularly, uh, Mike is really involved uh, in, in uh, equity and capital uh, uh, formation, support entrepreneurs around North Carolina. He has a, a you know, science background. Uh, he, he did a, a bachelor in microbiology and then he went to do a master's in microbial technology in 2012, as well as as an MBA, uh, uh, and uh, focusing really in technology commercialization from NC State um, 2013. Yeah. Uh, and, and he uh, uses all that background in, in science that he has as well to now employ that as well, you know, in, in his role with SBTDC and working with a lot of equity funding support, you know. So again, all of you who are logging on, who don't know him, he's a great resource to have. Our sec second speaker today is Sam Tetlow. You know, uh, Sam also has a, a quite an interesting background. He has a BS in aerospace engineering, but also has you know an MBA from Keenan Flagler, and uh, he works you know has different hats and different roles. You know, he works uh, uh, part of his role uh, working in, in venture capital. You know, he's in the screening committee for the Carolina Angel Network and a board member for RTB Capital. But uh, he's also worked, you know, as both an entrepreneur and or an investor in life science companies. Yeah, a lot in the triangle area, like Epicypher, Gen uh, uh, ILS Genomics, Immunologics, Gentrix, and and Transyme Pharma. And uh, also, uh, importantly uh, for us, you know, at Kickstart, we engage with him. Uh, he's one of our grant writing service providers. Yeah. Uh, and he is the CEO of a company called Grant Engine that again provides STTR and SBI grant writing support. And he has worked with many of our startup companies. And he'll tell you a little bit more about that later as well. And then finally, uh, uh, we also have Emil Runge, you know, who works at First Flight Venture Center, yeah? And now leads its health security accelerator, yeah? And uh, he has, again, a lot of experience, you know, supporting startup companies so well here in the ecosystem and obviously at first flight here. Yeah. And, you know, he is really leading a lot of this, uh, you know, both the first flight and, and the accelerator, leading a lot of the, 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 uh, the identifying the solutions that are for Varda that he's going to talk about a little bit about, you know, the opportunities for collaborations and events and also about, you know, just funding opportunities that, he has and all his experience he has uh, as well. Um, and uh, he'll be participating in the last part of the, the webinar that's gonna be the discussion to again, how of all of you who are connecting as a startup company that are looking for strategies, how to maximize funding are. So with that intro, uh, we'll start with, with Michael Carnes. Again, he's gonna be focusing primarily on some of this uh, relief programs, PPP, IDLE and others, but really uh, also looking into what SBTDC can do for your startup company as well. So thanks, Mike, please go ahead. All right, well, thanks, Maria. I uh, appreciate that introduction. Um, do we have, I don't know if we have a, a slide deck, I've sent one over, but um, there we go. You can 
maximize that. So yes, I'm a technology commercialization counselor for the North Carolina Small Business and Technology Development Center. I'm also our equity funding specialist. Uh, and, and primarily work with companies that are developing innovative solutions, raising R&D and commercialization capital to, to do that. Um, you can go to the next slide there, I guess. Or am I driving this? No. So I'm gonna be pretty quick and brief in my comments so that we can get to a more robust discussion and have some Q and A. Um, but I did wanna just give everybody a brief introduction to the SBTDC in case you haven't worked with us in the past or don't know about us. I think it's a great resource to, to make sure that you know about. Um, we have, uh, I wanna make a few points about some of the SBA funding programs that are available right now as a result of COVID and the economic climate. And then uh, we'll talk a little bit about navigating those opportunities. Okay, next slide. So again, our, our mission as an organization is really to encourage entrepreneurship across the state of North Carolina. And we do this by working with all types of small businesses from restaurants to front street businesses. But I'm part of a team that really works with uh, technology development and commercialization related activities and companies. Um, but we support the economic development across the state and that's how we measure our, our success as an organization. Uh, next slide. Um, we're funded in part by the Small Business Administration with, with matching funds uh, through the state of North Carolina. So we actually have offices associated with all the, the 16 UNC campuses. Um, and, and so we have a statewide reach and about 75 people across the state. But again, I'm part of a tech commercialization team. We provide that one-on-one -on -one business counseling. Um, and, and again, that ranges between helping companies that are still in research and development mode, a lot of university spin out companies that are competing for SBIR and STTR capital. We help companies think about strategies for, for targeting those funding mechanisms and review proposals uh, and things of that nature. I'm, I'm, I'm also, uh, as I mentioned, uh, run several um, events and activities uh, and trainings around raising equity capital. We have a program called Becoming an Investor Ready Entrepreneur. If you're new to the equity funding landscape, then I would certainly recommend that you, you check that out. Um, we do it about three times a year, but right now we're kind of changing things due to um, COVID and we'll probably be doing a large virtual investor ready entrepreneur in the late summer time frame. And so um, I'll make sure that everybody gets that information. We also pr provide student engagement opportunities and bring a bunch of students into work with companies from the universities. Okay, next slide. Um, so point number one, if you get nothing else from me in this conversation, um, make sure to check out the SBTDC's website. Right now, we have a large tab at the, at the top, navigating your business through COVID. So it's sbtdc.org, and then you click on this, and we are keeping, um, this up to date daily with the newest information that comes out about all the funding programs that are available for early stage or for companies in general, including the SBA funding opportunities. Next slide. Um, so, you know, I'm sure that most folks by now have heard about these SBA programs and the funding that's available through the Paycheck Protection Program, PPP, and the Emergency, uh, I'm sorry, Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program or the IDLE programs. Uh, we're going to just talk a little bit more about that right now. Um, so the, the PPP program has been, uh, you know, providing, starting to provide cash to companies right now that need it the most. Um, it's intended to uh, help keep people employed in businesses. And so you may have heard that uh, the, the first round of PPP funding ran out pretty quickly and uh, Congress reinstituted the program and refunded it earlier this week. And so there, there are more companies that are um, gonna get funded through PPP now. Uh, currently, uh, they're, they're, they're using the, the new funding to fund companies that had already applied for PPP, um, but once they get through the queue, they'll, they'll be taking new applications as well. Um, but uh, let's just hit some of the key points. So this program is for, um, for companies, small businesses um, certainly are applicable, can apply to the program, but it's, it's primarily, again, used to be paid for payroll. Um, it can be used for mortgage, rent, utilities to a small, smaller percentage, but 75% of it is really meant for um, re replacing payroll. 
Um, it's a forgivable loan program. So the, the money that doesn't, um, the, the, the cash that you use towards payroll and eligible expenses will be forgiven by your bank. Um, anything that's not forgiven would roll into a 1% loan with a, with a two year term. Um, you, the, importantly, you would apply through a financial institute or bank for this program. And so it's important that you work with your, your current bank or find another bank that would, would be able to process your PPP application. Um, interestingly, if you'll go to the next slide. Um, interestingly, there were some, some challenges with, with banks. So we encourage people to, to seek the PPP money from multiple banks. Uh, online lenders have, have been really good for this so far. So uh, they've been able to process a lot of these quickly. Um, so the helpful hints for the PPP program, um, the bank is really the, the judge and jury when it comes to these things. Uh, so when, if, if you're a company that's applying for PPP financing, remember that while this is forgivable financing, uh, the bank is going to get to ultimately make the call on whether or not the loan is forgiven. And so you want to make sure that whatever you do with the financing, that you, you maintain a really good relationship with your banker, uh, make sure to keep open lines of communication about how you're using the funding. And if you have any deviation from the, the, the plans that you originally had, make sure you, you just pass that by your, your banker or at least have an email trail or a record of, of anything that you're using that capital on. We also recommend that you put together a separate bank account for PPP funding so that you can track every dime that you're spending uh, so that it's more e easy when you go back to get, um, to get loan forgiveness. Uh, you can pay yourselves as business owners through this program, um, but again, make sure that you're not you're not paying for things that you, that you weren't necessarily paying for before COVID and economic downturn. Uh, the, the big thing with any of these SBA funding programs is, is it's important that you can demonstrate or say uh, you have to self attest that um, your business is at jeopardy uh, as a result of COVID and the current economic situation. And if, if you can't attest to that and feel comfortable doing it, then I, then I would suggest that you don't apply for any of these funding mechanisms. Next slide. So the idle loan, economic injury disaster loans, these are more of the traditional loans that are provided by the SBA for disasters. And the SBTDC has been a, a leading resource providing support to companies that are applying for disaster loans in the past. So every time a hurricane comes, Hurricane Matthew, Hurricane, uh, and the, the flooding that happened not long ago, every time we have a major disaster, certain counties will be uh, declared as disasters. And we've done a lot of work with helping companies get idle loans. This is on a massive scale, obviously. The whole country is now declared as a, as a disaster in terms of these idle loan programs. Uh, these, pro these loans are, are uh, more robust in what they can be used for. Um, they're more akin to a traditional bank loan. There's a requirement that for collateral, so companies have to provide collateral, um, they are there. They will also be more scrutinized in terms of uh, the credit worthiness of the of the team of the of the business owners, um, and and there will also be more scrutiny on um, ability to repay. And so that typically means if if your company was generating revenue and can demonstrate revenue history or cash flow, then you're going to be more way more likely to get approved for one of these loans. Uh, because you can show that you've, you've, you've had an economic impact or damage and you've lost revenue as a result of, of what's happening. Uh, but uh, both of these programs can be critical in helping keep businesses afloat during this time. So I would, I would encourage you, if you think that these opportunities might apply, reach out to me um, and I can, I can help kind of talk you through some of these programs or reach out to the um, uh, me and I'll connect you with some of our counselors in your region that can help with um, these SBA funding programs. Can you go to the next slide? This is just a little comparison table because you're going to get um, these slides. You can take a look at the differences between the emergency economic development loan and the um, PPP program. Um, and this is on our website as well. So feel free to go and explore that while you're in the process. And that's it.
Thanks. And um, I know uh, there's going to be time for questions at the end, so I, I would suggest we kind of keep some some of those for for uh, the last twenty minutes. Mike, this is Anil Goyal, a question. Um, in what is the general success rate expected of the PPP program? And what are the pit, where are people you think going to fall short in getting that funding? Hey, Anil, it's good, good to hear from you. Um, I, I would say that the, uh, I don't really have a good answer for what the success rate is gonna be. I think it, it more is gonna depend on the, the amount of capital available. Um, the, the the critical factors, as as I see it, are um, you, you know the the ability to um, uh, well with the with the PPP program, there's no need for collateral. We've heard about some PPPs being denied on the basis of credit, um, mm -hmm. uh, but you know in general, I think if if you're a company that has been able to demonstrate a um, uh, you know hop, historic operations with payroll and uh, and you can you know work out do the math and you can show what your 12 month running payroll has been you should be able to get access to this program thanks, um, thanks the, Mike the, the, Good big, to see the, big, the big question that comes into play is for for early stage technology companies especially should be whether or not um, the the COVID event has has significantly impacted your company, you know, yeah. and, it, and that's a that's a fine line with companies, especially if companies already have equity funding, or you know have SBR STTR capital and have some runway, um, you know, can you um, justify that you've been substantially impacted by COVID? And that's that's where the the line is. Some companies definitely can, some some won't be able to, but. Regardless, in the in the end, if somebody audits your company and asks, like, ask you uh, to to demonstrate that you did have economic injury, it's important that you're that you feel comfortable explaining and justifying why you needed the money. So, and, uh, Mike, that ex excellent for sharing that. So, we went through that equation, and we actually had just to cut salaries of our team uh, and to extend the runway, and that's that's a clear uh, demonstration that we were impacted. You know, by by the by COVID. So I appreciate you highlighting that point. Yeah, good, good. And then one one more question, and then we can keep the rest of the questions for the end of the session during the panel. Um, so uh, the question is: Would you agree that the key to to PPP is connecting with a bank? Yeah, that can help you navigate the process. Is that you think the most critical step? Yeah. Yeah, and every bank's administering it slightly different. Um, you know, at the same time, you there, there's one other quick feature that you need to be aware of. If you have raised equity capital, you may be subject to the SBA affiliation rules, and those affiliation rules state that if if your investor has, uh, even if they have less than 50% ownership, if they have, um, you know, controlling provisions and uh, rights within your company, they may there may be a claim that you are affiliated with all the other companies that that investor or investment group have invested in. And that could put you over the, the cap for being a small business according to the, to the rule. And so you, you need to be aware of those. And, and um, you know, I, I have a lot of companies that I work with that do have equity funding who have applied and are getting funded for the program but it's not really up to the bank to make the call on whether or not you meet the criteria. It's up to you to self attest to that. So just be aware of that and, and think of, about what that might mean in your specific situation. Great. Uh, so if you have any questions, please put them in the chat and we'll try to address them as well at the end of the session. But now, uh, Sam, would you want to go ahead with, with your presentation? Uh, Judy, can you yeah. load that? Thanks. Uh, good, good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Um, well, thanks, everybody. It's good to see and hear everybody. Um, and it's good to connect Anil uh, with you, Sonny, um, Chad and Selma, Ed on Fuego, uh, Rudy at Inatonos, Jin Song from Paratech, and Dr. Askew from NABGEN. I think we're all of the folks that are, call them audience, on the call are 
current or previous clients of Grant Engine. Um, so we, we like that. Um, we'll call that a, a good start. Um, and I'm, so each of you is familiar with the concept of Grant Engine. I'm going to give you some new news here about us as a company and um, then go into a little bit of the state of play of what's going on in the field, because that, that's really relevant field of COVID fighting technology, um, and then jump into where to get money. Um, so let's, I'm going to try and go quickly over the first uh, four slides. So yes, thank you. So we are here as a team at Grand Engine and in our lives to save lives um, and extend the length of a quality life. Um, this is why I do the life sciences work. I think this is why everyone on the call is probably focused on life sciences. Um, and that's really our end game. We take that pretty seriously. Um, and we have an impact by doing that of helping clients build great products and companies you know, through a, a, a differentiated and, and proprietary process. Um, so we'll talk more about that here in a couple of slides. Um, but of course, we're based here in Research Triangle Park. We support companies across the United States, 23 people. Um, almost everyone is a PhD. Um, and we have about half of our team here in North Carolina. The other half is distributed across the United States in all the places that you would uh, expect them to be. Um, we've got an, a win rate of, depending on the type of grant we go after, two to four times better than the national average. Um, and we submit a meaningful percentage of the grants to every year through the SBIR program to the NIH and uh, to the DOD. Uh, so we're, um, I think we are helping in some meaningful way to increase the average for North Carolina, uh, but really overall from a national side. So um, management team on the bottom, um, that's us. So you can, if we can jump to the next one. Um, so we've got deep experience. Uh, we've got an FDA uh, grants that support um, clinical work for orphan designated drugs. We do most of our work at NIH, BARDA, we're quite heavy in, um, NSF, and then the Department of Defense. So jump into the next slide. Just real quick on our process uh, here. This is something that everyone in the call is familiar with. Um, I think the things that are new and improved on the team and the process are we really broadened and deepened the team um, being much more selective about the caliber of people we bring on to the organization. Um, we had great folks to start and, um, and we are upping the talent level um, and also being intentional about therapeutic depth of expertise. Um, so broadening in that fashion, we think about the world as you think about the world, which is disease centric. Um, and then on the process side, just getting more and higher quality reviewers. Um, that's a key part of our process. So that's us. Um, next slide shows we also have an accounting and compliance division. Um, if you've ever gotten a government grant, which I'm pretty sure all of you have, um, you know you want help on this department, whether it's from us or someone else, just always helpful to, to not have to handle that level of brain damage um, to, and keep, keep it well inside those important uh, FAR rules from a process and an accounting standpoint. So we can help you with that if that's what you would like. Um, and the next slide is um, a track record uh, that we have completed in a, you can call it a controlled experiment um, with a large public university based in North Carolina um, over a longitudinal um, experiment of when Grant Engine is involved in a, in a strategic way, either we're helping to write the grant or we're doing external review. Um, we have um, a, a pretty good win rate. Um, I think we're keen to get this win rate closer to 100%, but um, it's not horrible right now. Um, and uh, we, you know, we, we don't show on this slide the, the comparative, but there is a, you could call it a control arm in this longitudinal experiment. Um, and I think the, where we're not adding value to the grant from a content standpoint, but we are just submitting the grant 
And uh, the difference between this blue line and that line, if you can imagine it, I don't put it up there because for reasons of, uh, I guess, sensitivity. Um, but uh, if you can imagine that line up there, the difference is not small. Um, so I think the point here is that if we work with you, you've got a pretty good chance of getting a grant um, sooner or later. Um, okay, so this is that's just a quick backstory of what's new for Grand Engine. If we could go to the next slide, we get into some of the, I'll say, more uh, on-point content. Um, so uh, this is the Grant Engine playbook, just generally, uh, and here COVID-specific. Um, so again, we're here to save lives and and save lives more than what we did yesterday, right? As a as a full team, as a as a community of the life sciences, and really what that comes down to is um, improving the standard of care, right? Today, there's we're fighting COVID in some way, or really not in some way, um, but a new product that's going to get a grant is really going to get a grant because it's improving that standard of care. So what we talk about is the differentiation of your product over the standard of care. And we, we this slide talks about it as it relates to uh, COVID-19 and, and the SARS-CoV-2 virus. But this approach, this uh, lens by which we look at the world for your product and how we go get grants is the same whether we're fighting COVID or triple negative breast cancer or, or any other disease. It's all about telling the right best story of your differentiation. Um, and it's a differentiation over you know, the standard of care. Um, and it's therefore crucial as we have all kind of woken up um, to a global pandemic in the last two months, um, what is the standard of care for COVID-19? And understanding that, I'll call it theoretical baseline of what do we know, what do we think we know today, and then what do we have to improve upon from here? And the reason I wanted to ground us in this slide, and this is, you know, I'm not all knowing, no one is, this is just what we think we know. And this is up for debate, right? I'm not trying to say this is the only answer, but this is just what we see. And, and what we see is that um, we've looked at this in kind of four domains, right? So treatment, vaccines, diagnostics, slash devices, and then what I'm calling core here, which really is like infrastructure. Um, and what we're seeing on treatment is that, you know, remdesivir is leading the pack on treating you if you happen to be conflicted with COVID-19. Um, this is a Gilead drug that was originally developed for Ebola. Um, it, um, and there's a slide here that has really interesting links inside it uh, that show, um, and this, this drug is quite far along. Yesterday, they showed good clinical results that moved the public equity stock market today and um, is thought to be the leading contender, or at least a leading contender um, for a treatment. Um, to be sure, there are hundreds of compounds in development, both on drugs and vaccines. So this is not gonna be the only solution for sure. But this, the interesting thing about remdesivir is that it does have a highly characterized development path in, of human study, looking at endpoints for safety and efficacy, um, non-human primates in uh, macaque and other animal studies, and then in, in vitro, human cell line in vitro. So it's a, it's a pretty compelling um, baseline for both results, but also the development path that it took. Um, so that's that one. Um, and, and again, that's not the only solution, but it, if I had to pick one, it would be that one, but also good benchmark info um, for, for how to, what, what endpoints you'd want to have in a, in a design trial. Um, and yes, Anil, we'll get to specific grant opportunities here in a second. Um, vaccines, diagnostics, um, and I'll say infrastructure are all really um, 
still emerging. So there's more time needed there. If we could jump to the next slide. Um, yeah, so here is specific funding opportunities. Um, so here's, these are all on Grant Engine's blog. So you can see these specifically. Um, and I'll, I'll give you the broad strokes of the details herein. Um, so BARDA uh, is very active. Um, this is called BARDA, the broad agency announcement at the top row. Um, there's also BARDA Drive, which is um, faster and less money. Um, BARDA, we've seen the typical activity there is you drop a white paper and do Corona Tech Watch. Um, the Corona Tech Watch um, responsiveness is very bad. And that's not a function of interest or desire. Um, bad, probably not the right word, but it's just, it just very rarely happens. Um, we've got some clients that are getting attention. I've had presentations with 30 people on those tech watch calls, but they've got a drug that's in clinical trial. Um, there's been something like 2,500 tech watch submissions since inception at BARDA. And in the last three months, there's been 2,500 more. So they're just overwhelmed and they just can't get to it. So I think unless you've already got a drive approval um, or have a drug in clinical trials, um, BARDA may not be your plus place to go. Think about drive. Um, the congressionally directed programs uh, under US AMRA are compelling. There's a clinical trial program. There's investigator initiated program. Um, there's also drug development that's not clinical. Um, these are military centric, so think warfighter, um, and those are due generally in June with letters of intent due in May and June. Um, you really want to and need to have a military connection there. Higher up on the food chain, the better. Um, DARPA is interesting. They've got an SBIR program. I think if you've got something that is a game changer, we've seen these BARDA Tech Watch calls have DARPA teams inclusive. Um, so the, that BTO office is something that you want to go after. I'd say if it's if it's real a real development effort um, that's you know two to million dollar plus in cost, get DARPA involved. If it's 250k for their SBR program, my advice generally would be think about NSF, BARDA Drive, or eventually the NIH. Um, but so DARPA has deep pockets and they're, they're playing. Um, I just, I don't know that it's worth anyone's time to go there for a, a phase one SBIR, but those are certainly available here. But, but really the strategic move is where that is. Um, and uh, let's do NIH. So interestingly, NIH, as I think everyone knows, very active. They've been involved in the Moderna trial um, and others um, uh, from helping advance the standard of care. Um, and they have issued many notice of special interests that bolt into an R01 program and the Omnibus SBIR program. To date, they have not issued a unique new solicitation that's COVID or SARS-CoV-2 related. Um, that's okay. That's why the Omnibus program is in place. So think about NIH. Um, there's a June drop date for the R01s and a September normal SBIR cycle. Um, this will be COVID heavy focus, but think two steps ahead, right? NIH is not necessarily quick. That's what BARDA is for, um, but there's going to be real money there. Um, NSF is compelling. There's a project pitch there. Um, they'll give you an answer in five days if it's COVID centric. And then you submit a phase one, they'll give you within two to four weeks, they'll tell you whether you're getting funded or not. Um, but that is 256,000. Uh, lastly, here on the federal programs, AFWORKS is um, the Air Force's answer to basically DARPA um, and BARDA. So this is, so Air Force is doing medical technologies. Um, this is, um, there's another program that's going to turn on here that's going to be due in June. So the, the, if that's not already been issued, um, well, that'll be on our website. Um, the, um, so it's not, the only one is not just due tomorrow, um, but they're doing med tech, um, broadly speaking, not just anything that, that addresses the Air Force itself. Um, so we are definitely seeing a big wave of um, both funding and interest. So 
that's the landscape. Happy to chat individually if you'd like, um, but all of these individual solicitations are on our blog and um, if you just go to the grantengine.com website, you can get there easily. Um, and then foundations and private, um, this, you can see these. Um, I think there's a lot of interesting things. The things that would be relevant for investigators at UNC, uh, there's this emergent ventures on the bottom, second to the bottom. Um, this is something called fast grants. Um, this is super quick. Uh, if you go to fastgrants.org, you can see the link or just click on that hyperlink. Um, it's, um, it's, uh, I think 50 grand, but it's super, as the name implies, super fast. Um, the Gates Foundation in the middle there, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is the single largest charity on this planet. Um, they're going to do some pretty big things. Um, so that's one to watch. PCORI, if you have an existing PCORI grant, you can get supplements. Um, and then CEPI is, um, is interesting. Um, their, their first wave has expired, but expect that to get renewed. Um, and Pfizer has some stuff going on that is academic PI centric. Um, we haven't gotten any of those yet, but that's something to just keep eyes on. So that's there as Chad was smartly noting a good resource, but that's the broad strokes. If we can just go back one slide, just to recap, you know, the things to think about are BARDA, BARDA or BARDA drive. As we talked about, if, if you already have a relationship in BARDA, think about the big broad agency announcement. Um, we know the new leadership at BARDA that changed out pretty recently. Um, so BARDA, uh, DOD through the US AMRA, NSF and NIH. Those are probably the, I call them the big four to think about. Uh, thanks, Judy. If we could jump to the last slide. Um, yes, thank you. Um, so this is just additional resources on the website. These are hyperlinks. Um, there's a small bit, you saw the COVID funding, data, there's a small business toolkit for you, and then resources for wellness. Um, last thing is, um, you know, if you've been troubled about what's going on coming out of our government leaders, um, you're not the only one. Um, this link here is a 17 page um, white paper that includes some of the who's who in the scientific world and the business world that got fed to the White House about a week ago. And this 17 page document walks through a lot of the particulars about what's happening now, what we can do immediately. And, um, and I think encouragingly what we've seen um, is the White House starting to feed this back out to the world. So I think I just wanted to offer a little bit of hope that you know, people are not sitting on their hands um, as this is all going out in the community. And, and I think all of us have been pulling together. It's, it's been pretty impressive to watch. Um, so that's what I wanted to leave us with today. Great. I think with that, we can move on to the, you know, the Q&A and panel discussion session. And, uh, you know, Emil, I wanted to also kind of invite you to kind of comment on some of the, uh, you know, the, the, I know you're leading a lot of the BARDA, you know, finding, helping, finding, new solutions for them with the health security ecosystem, you know, and, and so on uh, with first flight. So can you comment a little bit on the BARDA opportunities and others that you're aware of as well? No, I would say um, Sam did a good job of breaking things down. Um, kudos um, in, in regards to uh, if you go into the Corona Watch site uh, or the Tech Watch site that Sam was discussing, <clears throat> you'll see him break it down into, into four buckets that uh, pretty much mirror the four buckets that Sam was talking about in terms of diagnostics, therapeutics, vaccines, and other. Um, so, um, and in terms of um, what they're specifically looking for uh, with the larger broad agency announcement is there, if you're more advanced, and, and a key thing to remember with BARDA is BARDA stands for the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority. Um, as, as, as much, you know, if, if you don't have context on first flight, we typically have anywhere between 30 and 40 early stage science-based companies. Um, what I've seen from a drive standpoint is a lot of the companies that they've been funding are post-venture, um, you know, which um, that's useful, you know, or 
kind of at this roughly the same time as venture funding. Um, so where sometimes it, it, they work hand in hand. Um, so I, I, one of the things that I've been talking about to companies is kind of, you know, laying out many of the same things that Sam was laying out in terms of, hey, it depends on what your te technology readiness level happens to be. You know, it may be areas where you want to go ahead and, and look at BARDA, uh, but in addition to that, you may really want to look at NSF or NIH, um, you know, from the standpoint of basically moving your way through, the, through those pockets uh, to a, a longer term funding opportunity. Um, so, um, you know, as, as he'd noted, Drive, the funding there, Drive is made possible because they have to stay below $750,000. If you're applying into the bar to drive program, a key to thing to remember is you're going to need a cost share in there. That cost share is at least 30% typically. Um, and so that cost share can be, you know, it doesn't have to be cash. Uh, it, it can be indirect costs where you're, you know, it, think of it as the government wanting to basically say, hey, as a result of this dollar's worth of investment, we're getting an extra 30% back. Um, that seems to be their mindset on that one. Um, so, you know, just understand that going in. And I, again, I'm, I'm more than happy to talk to companies as they're looking to apply in the BARTA program, um, but then also highly recommend uh, reaching out to grant writing firms like Grant Engine uh, to go ahead and uh, navigate you through the process as well. And a question from, from the audience is, you know, can, can any of you elaborate on uh, uh, COVID and NOSI uh, programs as well. Yeah, can you talk about that? Yeah, I can. I can hit that um, real quick. So, um, so the the concept of a notice of special interest. This is really an NIH centric thing. Um, is that um, the NIH has existing um, RF P's or request for proposals, you know, solicitations upon which you can apply for funding. Um, they will, rather than issue new solicitations out to the world, they will designate that funding for special interest topics that are relevant and timely. Um, so a notice of special interest is not a commitment to fund. Um, it's not a new solicitation. It is a, um, you call it like a, an, alloc a, a, an interest of allocation that we think this is an important area. And this solicitation is now eligible for that new area. Um, it wants to be typically is um, institute center specific. And so they are all listed on the Grand Engine website. A, maybe an even an easier way to find them would be if you just Google, um, what did I just do? NIH NASI COVID. So, and it's the third link down but just you can see it you know, you find there's a there's a web page that's kind of a, a home page for nih coronavirus 19 um 2019 and and at the bottom they'll list all the notice of special interests by institute and when they turned on but pretty much everybody every institute center is has issued a notice of special interest um this says, you know, hey, COVID's a problem, we're paying attention, give us your tech. That's the short story. All the other normal rules apply for that solicitation. Um, and there's too much probably to go into detail here. Um, I can say some hopefully obvious things, which is NIAD has gotten much more funding in the last um, Emergency Relief Act that happened, but so have all well, I should say all, all the other institute centers have also gotten funding. Um, so especially heart, lung, and blood, um, but really almost every institute center has also gotten an increase in funding. And so this is a rising tide if you look at it in the strict sense. So anyway, that's the, that's the long story to that short question. If I can add on and ask Sam a question about that. So is the, uh, these special interest funding, are the program officers, do they have more discretion to release those funds more quickly or is it still gonna go through kind of the same, you know, six to nine month process to, to get those funds to companies? 
Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, it is the same process. So the, and actually that I should have mentioned this and I didn't Mike and that you, what you said just prompted another really good point that I, that I want to touch on, which is supplements. Um, but back to Nasi, um, it follows the same process of a typical grant submission to the NIH. So you've got to go through study section for peer review and they deliver to you an impact score. And then that goes to council and, you know, relationship with the program officer can matter um, for COVID just like it matters for every other NIH submission. But it's um, the NOSI doesn't give the program officer any different latitude in their own authority than they had in, in, in any other situation. Um, separately, um, your question prompted me to think of um, this thing called administrative supplements. So the on that same page, if you can get there, um, and I can put it on our website as well, but um, administrative supplements are coming up um, and those are available in a more meaningful way um, for um, COVID related topic. Um, and um, their, the budget that got released to the NIH has to be spent by their fiscal year end, right? So that is literally five months from tomorrow, right? So um, there's going to there's going to be an interesting run here in the next five months. Um, the um, what we're hearing for supplements is if you want to get into this year's fiscal budget, really talk to your program officer directly right now in the next two to th four weeks. And that's possible to get it in. If you go midsummer, it's just budgets are too tight. Um, so um, that's uh, there is a there is an opportunity to go after administrative supplements in ways that that is new, and that does follow a program officer specific authority. Right? They have kind of authority to push that through, and um, we've heard they have they have kind of two bullets, if you will, where if they like two projects, they can just make it happen. And then if they want to do a third and beyond, you've got to get that approved by the higher power up inside their Institute Center. Um, so that is something where that relationship and, and you interacting directly with your PO is very helpful under the, um, under the supplements program. And like, uh, those good, good. I'd like to go ahead and tag in with, with something that's related, but slightly different to what Sam was talking about. One of the things as you're thinking about this is to think about the, the mindset of the agencies that you're going after. Um, so for NSF uh, versus say BARDA, uh, one of the things that you'll hear about BARDA or DOD from a mindset standpoint is they're focused on those unknown unknowns. And so there it, it is, how do you go ahead and protect the nation from a national health security standpoint against those unknown unknowns? Um, and so their mindset is essentially what's keeping them up at night. Um, whereas with NSF, an, an analogy that I would use is what are they thinking about when they get up in the morning? So it's more of a whiteboard approach of what are the opportunities? What's the upside? Uh, how can you profoundly affect innovation? Um, you know, it, that's one of the things that I'll occasionally talk to companies about in terms of as they're figuring out which stream or what approach would make the most amount of sense for those agencies. With BARDA, one of the things that they're going to want is if you get your foot in the door, then they will frequently continue to fund you moving forward because they want, if you're in and you're able to demonstrate an ability to, to get it done, it's a contract, it's not a grant. And so they'll occasionally expand the grant, um, you know, I mean, expand the contract as you move forward. Again, whereas NSF, it's much more, how do you move the innovation forward? Uh, open to comments on that one, but hopefully that helps. Yeah, Emma, I, I just wanna um, say to everyone that um, we are so fortunate to have ML here in the Triangle. Um, he knows the organization very well and is an incredibly valuable resource in both his skill and experience as well as connections. So encourage you to reach out to him and build that relationship. It, it's been great for us at Grand Engine and, and 
been great for what we're what we're working on, which is to save lives. So thank, thank you. you Emma. Feel the same way. And, and on that note, I wanted to, to mention that, you know, uh, you guys were talking about the relationship with the, the program officers and, you know, uh, uh, First Flight is also organizing uh, this 2020 SBR road tour. Uh, it's in September, unless things get changed, you know, that you'll get a chance if you attend the, the program. We're, we're at UNC, we're also helping sponsor that as well. Uh, one of the sponsors, which is to really get to, to meet, you know, one-on-one -on -one with many of these program officers, yeah. Um, so it's a great opportunity to do that again and try to, to take advantage of, of this sometimes when it's hard to to do, but do reach out, you know, to again, all the people in the ecosystem to kind of connect you with, with them as well if you're having trouble somehow getting in touch with them as well. Um, another uh, comment, you know, Mike, I was gonna say, so having seen these two presentations, you know, uh, and knowing that our audience is very early stage companies, you know, um, where, where should they focus, you know, their efforts to be the most successful, you know? Should they be trying to apply for the relief programs, focusing more on the STTRs, both? Uh, you know, what would be the best strategy? Any, I open this for anybody, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I think when you, when you think about the relief programs, the, the idle loan, economic injury disaster loan program is not really designed for high tech companies. Uh, it's designed for more traditional operating concerns who are having, you know, disruption in their revenue. Um, and so from that perspective, you know, the question becomes, does the PPP program make sense? And is that a, a direction that you would want to go in? And I think a big part of that has to do with whether or not, um, you know, whether or not you can, you can justify the economic injury. But, I, you know, in general, for an early stage university spin, I think putting your putting more focus on non dilutive funding through SBR, STTR and other programs is going to be your best bet in general, unless you unless you need this funding to survive through the PPP program. Um, you know, there's also a question over here on the sideline uh, from Judy about if you're thinking about ra eventually raising equ equity capital, um, you know, what, what are you, what are the recommended strategies for short term in terms of non dilutive funding? I think this kind of goes hand in hand. I, I mean, I think it totally depends on your, your industry and what the key milestones are for your, uh, for your specific product type um, to help you reach that value creating milestone that investors are going to get excited about. And so, you know, working with your advisors and your, you know, business mentors around what those, those key uh, trigger points are going to be for your investors and then using the non-dilutive funding to get to those points. I think are, are, that, you know, that's, that's really the critical, um, one of the critical aspects there. Um, Sam, do you, do you have anything to add to that? No, it's, it's a great answer, Mike. I, I, I think, um, you know, if you want to get venture or angel money, eventually, which I think is, if I'm understanding the question properly, um, the, the fastest money is probably NSF or BARDA drive. Um, they're on a more on a rolling review and submission deadline. Um, and I would say that, um, you know, life sciences development, just as everyone would, totally agree it takes longer than you think it's going to take and so you know the nih time is going to come here soon um the um i will also say that for the unc spin out companies carolina kickstart not to not to bleed that well dry so to speak but it's been an amazing program that is fairly unique in the triangle and in the united states um as a pretty rigorous process, milestone driven. And, you know, it's not 50 million bucks or anything, but, you know, 30 grand, 50 grand can make a difference and can be that catalyst to, to get a little bit of money to get bigger money. So um, I, I found great success with Mira and, and of course, Don prior to her. So I, I think that's another place to go in the relative short term. Um, and then um, it's not, the, it's not, non-dilutive, it's dilutive, but the North Carolina Biotechnology Center also has a pretty interesting grant. Well, that is the grants program they've got is non-dilutive, but they've got a good loan program as well. So those are places to go in the short term that, um, 
are also a a good housekeeping seal of approval. You know, Biofluidica, which is a UNC spinout, we got a loan um, from them uh, right as we were raising the Series A, and we had the first investor meeting at the North Carolina Biotechnology Center, and we raised two million bucks in like six weeks. It was supernatural, um, and I, a lot of that is um, a testament to you know Vivian Doling sitting in that board meeting and walking through the process that she went through. So I, I would just encourage you to go down that road and Vivian and Greta and the whole team at the Biotech Center are, are, are also pretty awesome. Um, and it's not just the money, it's the, uh, it's a testament. So um, those are the places I would say off the top of my head. Um, and Mike, Mike and the team at the SPTDC is, is also incredibly helpful. So we've got a great set of community here in the area. Um, so. And if I can echo just one quick point um, that, that Sam made, you know, we've talked a lot about um, S, uh, NIH, SBIR, and DOD funding, but, but we, and we've alluded NSF a few times, but keep in mind that NSF for the right types of technologies, is a, it's a great program for early stage university spin out technologies that have a good business case that have that folks have gone out and done customer discovery and validated the opportunity. Um, you know, it, it would be one of, for for a fledgling university startup. It would be one of my you know top recommended choices to to consider because they really do want to be kind of the first money in. You can't look at it as a continual funding program like you you could get continual uh, funding from NIH or DoD or other agencies. But but for a for a startup um, kind of scenario with a validated business case, I think it's a great opportunity. So you don't want to overlook that for sure. I agree wholeheartedly with that. And that's, that's a great the, place to start. And then NIH um, is a is a good place to be looking after that. Great. Well, I'm conscious of the time, uh, so uh, we'll send all the materials that you guys have shared with us and the links with the rest of the team, as well as your email addresses, so people can can continue talks with you and we'll make this webinar available to people who couldn't connect as well so they can look at it later and i just wanted to end by saying you know currently kickstart does have a, a program for supporting sttr and sbr grant right services such as grant engine and uh, other companies that we work with as well so again if this is the time where you can't be doing research at the university it's a good time to be writing grants so by all means you know we we have one right now for covid related you know, technologies and projects, but obviously we, you can start working also with, with others, even if you don't plan to submit until the September deadline or other NSF ones, you know, we can also work with you on those. So please get in touch with, with us, you know, and, and again, there's a great ecosystem here and we're very happy to be working with all of you. So thank you all and Ma thank you everybody who joined the call. Manea, can I ask a quick question for the panel? Sure, sure. First of all, thanks very much for everyone's time. Um, and it's nice to see some of you guys uh, in person instead of by email. Um, so quick question I have as far as the NSF, it sounds like a pot of money that might be good. Um, but uh, so at least with what we're focused on, it's basically cancer therapeutics. Is there any way to uh, squeeze in the door with NSF? Um, and somehow, have you seen anyone successfully do this where they're kind of revamping a biotech approach for a certain uh, health problem? that would normally go to NIH, but somehow get it into NSF? So, you know, in general, in general, NSF doesn't, they're not going to fund any clinical trial activities like NIH will. Um, that, that said, sometimes they're, they're, they will um, do preclinical pre animal kind of testing and stuff like that. Um, but in general, if you have a pharmaceutical technology that you're trying to move through the pipeline, NSF probably won't be the best bet. NIH probably would be your focus. Have you reached out to National Cancer Institute? Uh, yeah, they've usually punched me in the face. Um, so, that sounds like a brutal process. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the pay, I mean that's, we've gotten funding from NCI. Just, as you know, the pay line is exceptionally low. So, you know, hearing of any pots of money that looks better, I'm always going to go for if it's reasonable. Yeah, so just to, to I'm gonna add hopefully a little something, um, NSF will not fund a program, generally speaking, if the NIH has already funded it. 
Um, but if the NIH has not funded it, I would pivot to the NSF. Um, the inverse is not true. So the NIH likes to fund things that the NSF has already funded. I'm speaking generally. There are always exceptions. but So that's kind of that status. Um, <clears throat> the other just more global point to your question, I think, is that, you know, cancer, right, immunotherapy has been a standard of care, right, for certain cancers. Um, and applying that same immune response to an infectious disease like COVID, there are some mechanistic corollaries there scientifically. Um, so that's a place to consider if you've not already thought of that. I think it, it's way hard um, because it's a whole nother development program. So if you want to pivot, I didn't say, think about that for the rest of the company's time rather than just trying to be opportunistic. Um, but I can share that uh, Rob Tarrin, who has a development lab at Marsico, has developed a COVID-19 mouse. Um, so he's a place to touch to see if there's some early experiments that maybe a compound or a mechanism is having some traction. Cool. Thank you. Well, I think with that, I think we can wrap up. And again, we'll be sharing all of this. And I encourage you, anybody who has further questions, to please you know, either send it to us and we can forward them, or we'll have the email addresses of, of, of Sam, my, and Emil as well, and there for you as well. So thank you again, everybody. Thanks for having me. And thanks, thanks, thanks for and hosting. Thank you very much for hosting. Hats off, thanks, everyone. Great job, Judy. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks,